Okay, we uh, we are back, Pamela, and uh, let's continue on the topic of the Afghan uh, cameleers, especially uh, how they went with the religion with the, with their religion in Australia. We are in the month of Ramadan at the moment, so tomorrow is the first day after Ramadan in Australia. Oh, okay. And I think this is some of the legacy that can track that back down to the Afghan cameleers and their history and all those mm-hmm. effort these people uh, put in Australia. So, uh, if you just summarize a little bit shorter, because obviously we don't have that much time, and how Afghan cameleers was actually doing their religion in a country completely different from what they were in Afghanistan. Well, don't forget there were other migrants who came here that also brought their religions with them. And all the migrants that came here set up their own temples or their own churches or their own mosques Mm -hmm. all right so when they came here most of them statistically were the word then was mohammedan or muslim now and they continued to live their lives according to their religion because the religion was an integral part of their life so um that meant that uh they still prayed five times a day if they could it meant that in the morning when they got up uh they would pray at their camp and then they would get up. It meant that when they're on the tracks, if they wanted meat, fresh meat, like I mentioned earlier, they'd pull into a sheep station to drop off supplies. They would get a sheep and kill it the whole way. Back in the Gan town, they had goats, they had sheep, uh, chickens. They would kill it the halal way. And they actually had their own butchers in, in where there's bigger communities to practice their form of mm. eating. Uh, they had spices with their food. Because they would, uh, their wives taught me the recipes for of the Afghan cameleers. So they've got their spices were brought over from India or Afghanistan. Um, they set up eventually little mosques where they were. So Mari had a little. Mosque. Okay, before the, before we go to the mosque, when you say they they were killing the animals in the way of halal food mm. and doing so. Uh, they didn't have the proper place to do it. They had to do it in front of their house or in the garden or somewhere. Mm. Was there any difficulties that those people could say uh, could face? Well, not personally, as in killing their uh, um, the meat, the animals their way. However, it was very well known that they did not eat pork. And sometimes they were taunted by that when people were getting to know them and getting used to their different cultures. So sometimes people would put, so you'd see a string of camels all loaded up and the, the Afghans being contracted to take them from a general store in a town out to a sheep station. Somebody would put bacon in one of their uh, bales and when the Afghan realised that he would just leave the whole camel string Sit, sit it down, leave the bales there and just desert it because it was offensive to them. One of the early mosques in Mari, because the, the, there was two versions of a mosque in Mari, one of them was actually abandoned by the Afghans because someone actually threw a dead pig into the mosque mm. just to was to harass them. And so then the Afghans so never... So they just abandoned that mosque. They never went again there? No. So then they built another mosque made out of tin, galvanised iron with an ablution pool. And eventually, that one eventually burnt down over time. But the first one was abandoned because someone threw a pig in there. So people did taunt them for that. But probably the same thing happened to other cultures. Right. But it seems there was a lot of problem then doing their even practice of their religion. Um, they were they were persistent with practicing their religion because even in their own homes, they, they when the children were born, they were given Afghan names. And in, in Mari, for example, there is a picture of the sons of the first Afghan cameleers wearing white uh, on, on their prayer day, which was Friday. Uh, in the early days in Mari, there was the call to prayer, was heard across the town of Mari, and the boys were taught the Quran. Uh, so they did intend to continue the religion. Now, those boys grew up remembering that religion. But when the first old Afghans that came here died, then those sons began to mix a bit more with the rest of the community. And so eventually they stopped practicing that religion. Mm. And especially when their, their, 
the mother was not from Afghan well, or from a Muslim yes. background. Well, the, none of the mothers another. were. Yeah. yeah. So what I, when I, what I found out was when the old Afghan died, if he was married to a white woman, that the children and the mother would stay around the town because they usually had, had a Christian background, whether it's Methodist or Presbyterian, it was Christian. And, and the Afghans would have two marriages. One would be in a mosque or in a mullah, with a mullah in, a, in an Afghan's house, the Afghan way. And then they'd have a church wedding. So the, the mother... Two who, marriages means with yeah. one woman. No, no, two. they got married twice, sorry. So if an Afghan married uh, any woman in Australia, they would have the Muslim marriage in the house if there was no mosque nearby, but they would have to uh, certify that marriage legally so they would have a Christian marriage or go to a registry oh. office. So they had the double marriage. So I can imagine in the mosque in Adelaide, um, when people got married in Adelaide, there were a few Afghans living around the, the mosque of Adelaide, that those papers that, that ver verify that they had a Muslim wedding in the mosque in Adelaide are not saved. But the marriage that they then had in the church nearby or in registry office, those records are saved. Oh, yeah. So in this term, obviously, the, the let's 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 get back to the point of the Islamic value of the Afghan, especially in the mosques. And mm -hmm. uh, the I heard in the Maori there was actually three mosques. Was that three or two? Oh, over time. Yeah, over time. Yeah. First, there was one made out of clay and uh, grass. That was the one that was deserted because someone threw the pig in there. Then they built uh, another one that was made out of galvanized iron. Mm -hmm. So that over time there was two main mosques. Two main mosques, okay. And um... now I'd like to share this with you, Fahim, as a researcher. It was told to me, and this happened in a few places across Australia, when the Afghans had an ablution pool near their mosque, whether it was called Gadi, just in a camp, or Burke, they would throw garnets or rubies in the water. Mm. And they brought them from Afghanistan with them when they first came here. Does that sound like a cultural experience that you would be aware of? Um, it could be, but uh, I can't clarify it because when... I grew up obviously in the mosque and seeing there was no pool sort of place to do right. evolution. There was normally mm. just a tap. You go there to doing stuff. But yes. It could be. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah because the wonderful thing about Mari is that there was um, an Afghan there called Sheikh Abdul Qadir, who I think was Persian. He was a uh, Parsi mm -hmm. and a Zoroastrian. He was very well educated, but he made a lot of money by trade. And he actually paid to have a date plantation set up at Mari and he had the irrigation system set up to provide the water for the ablution pool because he was looking after his countrymen too to, so they could practice their religion. There you go. There is a Persian kind of yes. background there as well. Very interesting. And uh, we have mosques in Australia, plenty mm -hmm. of mosques mm -hmm. obviously now, but there are a couple of mosques which is from the Afghan Kamalier's yeah. time. Mm -hmm. Which one is actually the oldest? That would be the Adelaide Mosque. The so permanent one. The first permanent mosque in Australia, the first permanent mosque, was built in Adelaide. In, uh, it was built between 1888 and completed by 1890 and paid by the Afghan Kamalias funds. Th they had a genuine mullah there. It was a mullah whose father was a mullah. It wasn't just a gardener who wanted to be the caretaker. Mullah uh, Haji Mullah. Uh, Haji Merabon. Yes, that's him. And he was the first mullah. And, um, but he, he dedicated a lot of the time to, I believe, there's five uh, um, pillars of Islam, which is one of his charity. charity. And so yeah. many, of the old, many of the Afghans there who could not get back home were getting old and sick. They would come to the mosque and he would look after them. He would actually even go out to Mari and earn a dad to check on the old men. So he put a lot of the money that was supposed to go to paying off the mortgage into charity. So about so 1893, another Afghan comes along who is quite wealthy and imports camels and comes to the mosque. Um, he himself, called Abdul Wahid, had a big reputation in Australia. He was a camelier that ran his own camel carrying company in Burke. But he paid off the mortgage of the mosque so that the mosque would always stay in the hands of his fellow countrymen. Right. We actually should discuss on the history of individual in Afghan Kamaliers like Abdul Wahid mm -hmm. is one of the big uh, big history around mm -hmm. him mm -hmm. uh, Muhammad Alam and Bija Darwish all Bija of these Darwish, people yes. uh, but for now obviously we just uh, try to make a general 
General was really well, good. Just finishing off with the mosque, Spain. The second mosque built in Australia, the first, second permanent mosque was built by the Afghans too in Western Australia. They put their funds together in at, Perth, in Perth, and yeah. they built the second permanent mosque in Australia. So that is part of the heritage of the Camelias in Australia. When we go to the Perth mosque, the yeah. first thing you see is stone mm. written in Persian language, which mm-hmm. is normally very interesting to see. Yes. And how about the Queensland mosque? There is a mosque over there. Oh, Clonkari? Yeah. Yeah, that's a little tin hut. That was... Some of the Cameliers who had camps around Australia didn't have permanent mosques. They had a little mosque at Clonkari. They had a little mosque at Burke. um, They had a little mosque at Farina. They had a little mosque at Coolgardie. So that would be the nature of those mosques. So if they're saved now, that's because the local council has put money into maintaining the replica of that mosque. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, beautiful. I mean, um, I guess these days we are so lucky in this country. There is no problem with the religion based mm. and compared to what the Afghan camelier went through. Yeah, uh, because it was all years new. Ago, yeah. Look, the, the people were fascinated by camels and cameliers. In the 1880s, the newspapers wrote so much about them, which is great for researching, because the country was both fascinated by the cameliers and a bit distrustful of them because their religious practices were different. Uh, the way they arranged marriages, they paid for the girls that they married. That was the culture back in their country. But I've heard stories around Adelaide where um, some of the old Afghans who used to live in southwest Adelaide would see a young young girl especially they marry a lot of Irish girls and they see an Irish girl and go to the father and say I like your daughter how much do you want for her <laughs> now he was talking from his culture but yeah. you know to an Australian that sounds very strange and so, then was actually strange for the Irish men uh quite quite a few Afghans married Irish girls and some of the marriages worked and some of them didn't no when when, when they said okay we pay for your girl would that mm, be offensive that, that was a dowry offering a dowry you know like you know, in Afghanistan, when when the girls are kept at home, when they're teenage girls, they're mm-hmm. kept indoors, mm-hmm. and then then a young man will come along, or a man who can afford to marry her will offer a dowry. Yeah, yeah. That's what the old Afghans did in Australia. That's how they met their wives too. And then my question is actually, was the people like the father of the girl? Would that be offensive for um, this asking or not? Well, you know, it, this is a particularly personal story, but there was an an Irish man who had a bit of a debt. And he was living in southwest Adelaide and an Afghan liked his teenage daughter. So the Afghan said to the father, look, I'll help you with the debt. I'll give you some money towards that debt if you let me marry your daughter. And that's how that marriage happened. And the Afghan would promise not only money, but also to look after, he had to look after the father and the mother of the young bride as well for the rest of their lives. How interesting. This is very similar to what's happening in Afghanistan. It is exactly. There, is yeah. a, there was a film called Love and Marriage in Kabul. It was made about four or five years ago. And the same culture I saw there is exactly what happened here in the early days with the Cameliers. Mm. It's like they brought their culture with them. It's fascinating. It's that people didn't ask enough questions earlier on to learn more about their culture. And the way they named their daughters, they gave them Afghan names and they mm. wanted their daughters to raise the sons to be good Islamic boys. And, you know, and the girls always had to stay inside and had to be chaperoned. It, it, there was not a lot of a resistance, though, from their wives and the daughters of the Afghan Kamaliers in those days. Hmm. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah.